Well, we are continuing our 20 words series. So, so far we've covered the words revelation, then scripture, then Lord, then last week we covered world, and students, tonight we're going to cover the word sin. So, this, uh, this is prepared for adults, and God said, I've got another plan. So, I, I want you to know, we are going to talk, uh, we're going to have some big words tonight, students. There are uh, there's some concepts that we're going to cover that are heavy. They're difficult. There's some college level stuff in this, and I think you're good. Not in the sense of sin, but I think you're good in the sense of you can you can follow me, you can follow this. But I am going to ask you to lean in. I'm going to ask you to engage your brain. And if there's moments you go, what is he saying? Pray. Say, God, would you help me understand what we're talking about tonight and why this is so important? All right, so. I want to start with a tough question, and that is this, if I turn this on. First question is, who cares? I think it's an important question when we have a word like sin. Why are we talking about sin? You might be saying, I go to church, we talk about sin all the time, why are we talking about it again? We have a limited number of times, there's 52 weeks in a year. So if we have 52 Sundays, and if we have 52 Wednesdays, why are we taking an entire Wednesday evening to talk about one three-letter word? Is it really that big of a deal? All right. So it is that big of a deal. Let me tell you, give you really quickly three reasons why I really think that you should care. And if you have one of the handouts and you have a pen, you can start filling in the blanks and you can follow along. Okay. First of all, we should care because if we don't understand this little word sin, we actually can't understand life. If we don't understand the, the biblical concept of sin, then we're not going to understand God. We're not going to understand what he's doing in this world. We're not going to understand ourselves. We're not going to understand why it's so frustrating when we do stuff that we don't want to do. We're not going to understand other people and why they make such damaging decisions in their lives. If we don't understand this word, we are not going to understand the world around us. And we definitely will not understand this book that we're reading. And what's going on in this book. So that's the first reason why we should care and why this is so important that we're talking about tonight. Secondly, we should care because the world around us does not understand this word. Our world misunderstands the word. When, uh, when we think of sin in our culture, in our world today, it's often thought of as, we can use this definition, a breach of the accepted standards of decency. Let's say it that way. It's a breach of the standards of decency. In other words, someone has done something that they probably shouldn't have. We have, I've even heard this word, some people will replace the word sin with the word mistake. Yes, a sin is almost always a mistake. Not, it's not always, but a lot of times it is a mistake. The word mistake does not capture the depth of what this word is. I've also heard the word sin uh, agreed with, um, I've heard it used with the word selfishness. That is true. Sin is often selfishness. But selfishness is not a big enough word to encompass what sin actually is. It's, it's insufficient. And so our world doesn't understand what sin actually is. And, and when we misunderstand the depth of sin, when we misunderstand the significance of sin, then we misunderstand ourselves, we misunderstand God's word, we misunderstand God. To start off with, we'll define it more officially in a moment, but to, to start off with, we need to start thinking in terms of sin is an offense against God. Yes, sin can be a mistake, Yes, sin is often selfishness, but it's far more. Sin is a, an offense against God. And as soon as we start thinking of it in terms of it's against God, all of a sudden the stakes get higher. So thirdly, we need to understand we should care because everyone sins. In 1 Kings 8.46, we read, When they sin against you, and then there's parentheses in the Bible, and it says, For there is no one who does not sin. Romans 3.23, we all know this verse, right? It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 1 John 1.8, we, we quote 1 John 1.9 all the time. But 1 John 1.8 says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. 
We all sin. So that needs to be out on the table, and it's a reason we should care. So what does the Bible have to say about sin? So if you didn't care about sin or this word uh, 35 minutes ago when you walked in, I hope you care more now, and I'm asking you for 24 minutes. Give me 24 minutes, and I think if we spend these next 24 minutes in God's word wrestling with what does this word actually mean and what are we supposed to do about it, we'll have a greater sense of what God has done and how much we desperately need it. So here's, here's the tonight in a nutshell. Sin is devastatingly awful. Sin is devastatingly awful. But God is astonishingly forgiving. So there's going to be heaviness tonight as we are reminded and we have to grapple with what is sin. But there's also this incredible, incredible beauty as we see what God has done about sin and Jesus' love for us. All right. So what are we talking about? What is this word sin? Why is it devastatingly awful as I have claimed? So let's, let's look at some definitions. You've got this on your handouts. Uh, Wayne Gruden said this, sin is any failure to conform to the moral law of God in act, in attitude, or even in nature. We're going to explain that a little bit more in a moment. Charles Ryrie says it this way, sin is anything that does not conform to the glory of God. And he gives a couple of verses, 1 John 3, 4, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. I like this definition because sin isn't just this. We think of it in terms of, well, if I cross this line or if I cross this line. No. Sin is anything that doesn't conform to the glory of God. And that's why Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, 10, 31, do all to the glory of God. That's how we should be living our lives. Packer says it this way. We're going to start to get, get into the nuts and bolts here. So lean in and, and think about these words. Sin is failing to hit a target or reach a standard or failing to obey authority. Sin is turning out of the way he has commanded and into a forbidden way of our own. And all of us have done this. God has said, this is the way that you need to go. And every one of us in this room at times have said, but I want to go over there. Okay, it's as simple as you need to eat a salad. I really want a bowl of ice cream. And we do. We make those choices each day. He continues, sin is going contrary to God, retreating from God. Now this gets really personal. Sin is retreating from God. And maybe you're there tonight. Sin is turning one's back on God. Sin is defying God. Sin is ignoring God. Ouch. Packer goes on to say this. Sin is playing God. It's refusing to allow the creator to be God. So far as you're concerned. Living not for him, but for yourself. Loving and serving and pleasing yourself without reference to the Creator. Trying to be, as far as possible, independent of Him. Taking yourself out of His hands. Holding Him at arm's length. Keeping the reins of life in your own hands. Acting as if you and your pleasure were the end to which all things else, God included, must be made to function as a means. He concludes with this, sin is exalting oneself against the creator, withholding the homage due to him, which means withholding the, the praise due to him, the honor due to him, and putting oneself in his place as the ultimate standard of reference in all life's decisions. Many, likely most, maybe even all of us have done that. We've referred to ourselves, thought of ourselves as the ultimate decider. We even at times have the audacity to read this and decide whether we think it's true or not or right or not. And when we do that, we're putting ourselves in the place of God and sin. So what does the Bible say? What does sin look like in the Bible? I'm going to ask you to turn to a few different passages. Okay, so first of all, turn to Romans 1.26. Okay? There'll be some that I read that we won't turn to, but you need to keep your, your finger, fingers nimble. And uh, we're going to start at Romans 1.26. I would love for you to read these in your own copies, okay? Um, and I'm sorry we're in a room that we don't have extras. Um, here, let me share. I've got, I've got it in my notes as well. You're good. All right, Romans 1.26 says this. 
For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. I'm reading in Romans chapter 1. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness. And now Paul is just going to launch into this list of this is what sin looks like. All unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Oh my. Galatians 5.19 says this, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Wow! This is serious. Those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. He includes in that list outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions. 2 Timothy 3, verses 2 through 4 says this, For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, uh uh-oh, unthankful, uh uh-oh, Unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. These descriptions of sin show us just the, 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 the expanse of, of how, how big sin is and how many areas of our lives it can be displayed in. What kinds of things did we just read? We In those lists was the word whispers. That's when we gossip. When we say things that we shouldn't have said. Outbursts of wrath. We've all probably, you, each body is different. Some say it's when your, your blood boils. Some For some of us, your jaw, you clench your jaw. Right? Some you can, your, your, the hair on the back of your neck starts to, to raise up. I'm going to get them. Selfish ambitions, that's when I come first. Jealousies, why does she get a new phone? Undiscerning, untrustworthy. Anybody in here, don't raise your hand. Break a promise recently. You let a friend down, you said you'd do something, you didn't. Hmm. Unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. I'm guilty of every one of those. So let's lean in even a little closer. That that is like a blast from a shotgun. You go, oh dear. But the Bible talks about sin and it it uses, there's some 20 different words that the Bible uses. And in English, it's the same. We have lots of words. We say, I messed up. We say, you know, I blew it. We say, I let you down. We say, I sinned. We we have lots of words that we use. And, And the scriptures are the same. There's lots of different descriptive words. But find Micah chapter seven, verse eight, if you will. Micah chapter 7, verse 8. Micah 7, uh, 18, excuse me, 18. Micah 7, 18. We'll get there in just a moment. But in the Bible, there are several words that are used often. And I wanted to show us three because now as you read, especially in the Old Testament, but as you read these words, I want us to know what these three words mean because it gives us a, a, a deeper sense of what this is when we talk about sin. So Micah 7, 18 and 19 are, are two of my favorite verses in the Bible says this. Actually, let's take a volunteer. Someone like to read out loud Micah 7, 18 and 19. Go ahead. Go.
I love it. Thank you, Robin. I love these verses. Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity? Now, you can see in this paragraph, he, these two verses, he uses three different terms. Iniquity is the first one. That's the Hebrew word avon. Then the next one is transgression. When Rob re read it, he used the word rebellion, which is great, uh, because that's what the word means, transgression, pesha. And then you can see the general word down at the bottom, sins, is hata. So let's look at those specifically. Now, if you have a different uh, English translation than this, you do the translation. It'll be that most English translations, they use the same word uh, each time. So whenever you have the word avon in Hebrew, often, like the New King James, will use iniquity. If you have a different word there, then your English Bible will probably use the same English word each time it comes to avon. All right? What do these words mean? First of all, iniquity, avon, means a perversion of your inner nature. That means inside we're twisted. It, that word means that's why we sin is because we are twisted, we are perverted inside, and then that comes out of our mouth and it comes out of our, 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 our ideas, our desires. That's iniquity. The word transgression uh, when Rob read it, it's, that's the word pesha. It, it's a willful rebellion, or it's also used to mean revolt. That's the defiance. When God says, this is out of bounds, and I say, I don't care. I'm going there anyway. It's willful rebellion. And then the, the general word for sin is the word hata. In, in Greek, it's hamartia. We see that in the New Testament. And this is that general one. We've probably all heard this definition. That's to miss the mark. That's what I'm guilty. Okay, and here's why this is helpful to me. If you look at this list, so the bottom one, we all get that. That's a specific act of sin. When, when I do things, acts that are wrong, when I lose my temper, or when I say unkind words, or when I have an unkind thought. If you think about this, um, James mentioned this earlier in our prayer time. When we look at someone else, and we see them as anything less than a beautiful uh, image bearer created by God. If we see them anything less than a beautiful image bearer of God, we're degrading God's creation and that's sin. We've missed the mark. We're dishonoring God because we're dishonoring one of his children. And that's a specific act that makes us guilty. But if, there's more than that. If you go to the next one up, transgression, that's rebellion. And I do that too. It's not just that I do specific things wrong, but it's my, my inner nature tends towards rebellion. And some of us have this stronger than others. For whatever reason, I, I have really struggled with authority in my life. My teenage years, young adult years, I was incredibly defiant. And it's, it's, who I, it's the sin nature in me. And then... Iniquity. Why am I so rebellious? Why do I miss the mark all the time? It's because I'm, I'm twisted on the inside. None of us want to be called a pervert, but it's actually what the Bible says about us. We're perverted on the inside. And because our inner nature is, is perverted, it, because it's twisted, it comes out of our eyes. It comes out of our mouth. It comes out of our hands. It, it comes from the inside. Now, we can see this also in Psalm 103. All three of these words, iniquity, transgression, sin. It's in Psalm 103. It's in, in Psalm 51. Let me just read Psalm 103 to you because I love this again. David says, God, he has not dealt with us according to our sins. So he's saying God has not dealt with us according to all these times that we've missed the mark. He says, nor punished us according to our iniquities, meaning God hasn't punished us according to how twisted and perverted we are. And we can say, thank you, God. He goes on and says, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions, our rebellion from us. I love that. So we've established we're all sinners. And the world makes light of our sins. It's not that big of a deal. But it's actually an offense against God. And we have not conformed to his glory, and we've failed to uphold his standards, and we've tried to play God's role in our own lives, haven't we? So, what does that do to us? Now, you've got a back uh, second page. 
and we're going to need to fly through this. But this is very important as to what this does to us, okay? So I said in the beginning that sin is devastatingly awful, and God is astonishingly forgiving. So we're going to dive in even more as to why is sin so devastatingly awful? What does the sin do to us? Sin destroys us. And as we understand how much sin destroys us, then that helps us to see how loving God has been to us and how far he's gone to rescue us from the sinfulness that we're trapped in. And it displays his beauty and his glory, how amazing he is, okay? So let's go, let, we're going to speed up a little bit here. Number one, what has sin done to us? It has condemned us. We are in condemnation. Ezekiel 18, 20. If you will, I know that's not a book that we go to often, but you've got to see this verse. Turn to Ezekiel 18, 20. The, the verses that I'd like you to turn to, they're, they're going to be bold, uh, in bold font. So Ezekiel 18, 20. This is one of my favorite verses in Ezekiel. It says this. This is a principle in the Old Testament that is a glorious principle. Ezekiel says this, the soul who sins shall die. Now that's not super exciting, but what does it say after this? The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself. The wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. So there's, there's a double-edged thing there. The principle is this, I will, I am condemned for my own sin, but I'm not going to be condemned for Gary's sin. I'm not condemned for my dad's sin. So it doesn't matter what your mom or dad did. It doesn't matter your family. God says you are accountable for your soul. Now, in a way, that's good news, right? But the problem is we've already established each of us sins. So we are condemned. I'm only held accountable for my sin. That's the good news. The bad news is I'm a sinner and I'm condemned. All right? So Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And even better news, so we're condemned in our sin. The soul who sins will die, Ezekiel 18.20. But Romans 8.1, there is therefore now what? No condemnation in Christ Jesus. So if we are in our sin, we're condemned. But if we're in Christ, there's no condemnation. And that's what we need to hear, right? All right. So, condemnation. Second, defilement. Mark 7, 18. If you'll turn to Mark 7, 18 in your Bibles, please. Mark 7, 18. We'll get there in just a moment. Let me read Isaiah chapter 6. This is Isaiah's vision of the throne of God. Isaiah, in Isaiah 6, he says this, verse 3. One cried, these are his cherubim, one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, so this is Isaiah's response to the holiness of God. Isaiah says, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. We are defiled. We are unclean. And Isaiah could see it when he was confronted with the holiness of God. I'm defiled. Mark 7, 18 Jesus is talking, and he says to the, to the group, he says, Are you thus without understanding also? I'm reading in Mark 7, 18. Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from the outside cannot defile him? Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. And he said, What comes out of a man, that defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. So what Jesus is teaching there is he's saying, he's telling us about that inner twistedness, that pervertedness. That comes out of us. It proves we're defiled. Mm. And thirdly, we're depraved. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. We'll get there in a moment. We're depraved. So, when God created Adam and Eve in the garden, they were perfect. They, they were upright. Ecclesiastes 7, 29 says this. Uh, Solomon said, Truly, this only have I found, that God made man upright. But they have sought 
out many schemes. See, God made man upright, but Adam and Eve tried to scheme their own way. They tried to find their own way, and we do the same thing. So what does Ephesians chapter 4 say? Look at this carefully. Is there someone that would like to read Ephesians 4, 17? Someone ready? Go ahead, Keith. Go ahead and go 18 and 19 if you don't mind. Thank you. These, good, good, keep going, you're good, 19. So these are very difficult words, descriptions to, to wrestle with. What Paul is saying is that he's saying this, we're talking about our depravity. And he gives a description of our depravity in, in, in those verses 17 to 19. I wanted you to see them in your own Bibles. Our depravity is displayed in our darkened understanding. We don't understand things well. We can't see things well. Our, he says our minds are futile. He says we are alienated from God. He says we are ignorant. And he says our hearts are blind. And so because of that, we give ourselves to all kinds of uncleanness. This sounds disgusting, but it is. The picture that Paul's painting here is... We're running around looking for pools of sewage that we can do cannonballs into. That's how we're living our lives. Apart from Christ, apart from what God does in his grace and restrains the evil in us, we are running around looking for people's pools in their backyards that are full of sewage, and we're diving in as fast as we can. That's how we live our lives. We're depraved. Now, depravity doesn't mean that we're as bad as we possibly could be, and often that's God's grace in restraining us. And all of us that are older, we will say, amen, yes, God has protected us so many times from ourselves. But what depravity does mean is it means that none of us are as good as we should be. Okay? So, that leads to this, and this is very difficult, number four, but we need to understand Romans 8. Go to Romans 8, verse 7 and 8. We are unable... Sin has, has made us, uh, has, has, we are unable to please God. Romans 8, verse 7 and 8 say this, because the carnal mind, that's the mind that's, that's an unsaved mind, it's not been redeemed by Christ, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, and here's the phrase, Romans 8, 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So please, please hear me. Y'all have been very patient. Got to lean in right now. This is so important that we understand this. In our natural state, that means the state that we we're born in before God intervenes in our life. In our natural state, we cannot please God. We are unable to please Him. Packer explains how devastating this is. He says this, when God commands those, because we are unable to please him, when God commands those who are in the flesh to repent and believe in his son, they can't do it until their hearts are made new. And so this brings us to this vexing question of free will. And we've been arguing about it for centuries. I think it's actually, we're about 1,800 years in counting. Okay, so here's the question. If we're unable then does, does that mean we have a free will? Okay, so hear me on this. The short answer is yes, we have a free will. And here's why. Packer explains. So, so listen, I like his, his explanation. The simplest answer is that our wills are free, but we men are not. Our wills are free in the sense that we have the power to do what we will in the realm of moral action. But we ourselves, as heirs of Adam, we're slaves to sin. That's John 8, 34, Romans 3, 9, Romans 6, 16 to 23. Which really means that we shall never, in fact, will, with all of our hearts, do the will of God. Therefore, man in the state of sin can never please God. His tragedy lies precisely in the fact that his will is free. And that he has the power to do what he wants and chooses to do. For what he wants 
and chooses is always in some form self-glory and so sinful and ungodly and hence all that he does is increases his condemnation. So our free will condemns us. We desperately need God and we choose to look for the sin unless God intervenes. Praise be to God that he does intervene, right? So what does this mean right now? Number five, we're under God's wrath. Romans 1.18 says this, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. The thought of God's wrath should sober us. If you've been reading through the Bible and you've just recently read through the, the plagues in Egypt, we should be sobered by God's wrath. And apart from Jesus' uh, sal- his offer of salvation, his death on the cross for us, God's wrath is on us, and, it's, and sin is devastatingly serious. But here's the good news. Romans 5.10 says this, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And there's more good verses coming. Jesus died for us in our sin. We're not left in our sin. But if we don't do anything about our sin, we will die. All right, we will die. Ephesians 2, 1 says this, and we had this last week. You he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So in our natural state, it's bleak, isn't it? We're condemned, we're defiled, we're depraved, we're unable to please God. God's wrath is on us, and we are dead spiritually. So what do we do? What do we do? Give me about two more minutes and we'll close. We need to place our faith in Jesus Christ. We need to place our hope in Jesus Christ. He is our only hope. And so tonight, I'm being serious. Zero in on me right now. If you, you're okay. If you just spent the last 20 minutes and went, oh no. That is describing me. I am pursuing my own desires. I'm frustrated with my parents. I'm frustrated with my teachers. I can't stand my neighbor. I can't stand my spouse. I don't know. Don't tell me. But if you've been these last 20 minutes going, "Ah, that's me. And you're realizing right now, I haven't dealt with this sin. The first step for any of us, for all of us, is we need to place our faith in Jesus Christ. We need to believe that Jesus died for us and he rose again. We need to believe that Jesus' death on the cross, it actually paid and covered all of my sin. And the Bible, the the image that the Bible gives us is so beautiful. It it tells us about robes of righteousness. When Jesus washes us, we've been running around in those pools of sewage, and God washes that off, and he gives us beautiful robes of righteousness. Jesus' righteousness will will cover up. He washes off all the sin, and then he, he, he clothes us with Christ's righteousness. It's unbelievable. But we've got to cry out and confess our sin. We need to turn away from that sin. And so if you've never done that, do it right now. Do it right now. There's no reason to wait. You can ask God to forgive your sin and he'll forgive you right now. Now, if you've asked him to forgive your sin and you know that you've been washed clean, then now your response is you should praise him. You should thank him. Because his love for us is amazing. As I went back through and read these verses again and realized my need of God, it should fill our hearts again with thankfulness for what Christ has done because we were dead in our sin. And he saved us. He loves you. And if you say, okay, Pastor Dave, I get it, but I, this makes me nervous. I, you read all those words about sin and I don't even know what half of those words mean. Well, here's my encouragement to you. Jesus tells us what he expects of us. And so I encourage you to study Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, and Matthew chapter 7. Those should be the three chapters that you dive into. Jesus tells us what he's looking for. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. Start there. And then Paul gives us really specific instructions in Romans 12. It's a great chapter for Christians. What is God looking for from me? And then from there, go to Colossians 3. Those five chapters will tell you how Jesus wants you to live your life in him as he gives you strength, as he helps you. He's the one that can start to transform your heart and change you from the inside out. It's not going to be your strength. Let me close with one prayer from David. Psalm 139 
is a beautiful psalm. And David prays this prayer, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Father, it's what we need. I ask for myself and I ask for each of us tonight. Would you forgive our sin? Father, we thank you that once you've forgiven our sin, we are made right. And that sin is no longer held against us. There's no condemnation. We are forever held in your grip. And we thank you for that. Father, we know that sin is an offense against you. And so then when we sin again, even as your children, it it hurts our relationship with you. So, Father, I, I ask for myself, for my family, for our church, would you please purify us? Wash the new, the fresh sins away, the sins of today. Would you draw us back to you? And Father, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your love. We thank you that you are a God that forgives. As much as we've messed up stuff, you are willing, you are patient, you are kind, you forgive, you welcome us back, you clean us up, and you make us right. And we say thank you. Thank you, thank you. It's in your precious son's name we come to you. Amen. Our next word is grace. So I invite you back for that. Have a good night.